Okay. Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, if we could. Yeah, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for uh, this morning and grateful for the freedom that we have in this country to worship uh, as our conscience of our, as the dictates of our conscience guide us. And we know that we don't take this freedom for granted. We know that there are many places of the world today that don't have this freedom. In fact, there are even some places in the uh, late great United States of America that don't have this freedom. But we have it here today. And so we want to make um, the best of it, be good stewards of it as we study your word this morning. Uh, Just ask for the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And with our topic uh, this morning and also in the main service that follows as we continue in the book of Genesis. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, come on in, everybody. If you could find your, take your Bibles and open them to Matthew chapter 23. And verse 37, Uh, I want to thank Brother Jim, Pastor Jim, for filling in last week. I'm sure you guys enjoyed his message. Say an amen if you enjoyed. (laughs) Just trying to, just trying to build his confidence back there. Uh, We all need our confidence built. Um, as you know, in Sunday school, we've been doing this teaching on the doctrine of the rapture. We explained what is the rapture, and then we got into the subject of when is the rapture. And we are of the persuasion that the rapture, as the top of the chart indicates, will take place before the tribulation period even begins. We gave seven reasons for that. And if you had a emotionally well-adjusted, psychologically balanced pastor, he would have stopped the study there. But you don't have a emotionally balanced, psychologically adjusted pastor. Um, you've got someone that likes to, you know, overturn every single rock, leave no stone unturned. So we move from there into a section where it's entitled Strengthening the Pre-Tribulational Rapture Case. So how do all of those other passages build the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture? And in that section, we've looked at John 14, 1 through 4, Revelation 3, verse 10, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, and then we stopped last time after three weeks of somewhat controversial information dealing with the departure comes first, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. And what we're moving into now is an area that is also a source of tremendous confusion, and it's called the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24 and 25. And that's why I had you open up really to the few verses just before Matthew 24. Matthew 23, verse 36, 37. So why in a conversation about the rapture are we going into Matthew 24 and 25, the Olivet Discourse? And the answer relates to the fact that the Olivet Discourse is used by people over and over again to deny the pre-tribulational rapture. Um, Not all pre-tribulationalists do this, but certainly almost every post-tribulationalist I've ever heard goes to Matthew 24 and 25 as some sort of proof that the church will go into the tribulation. 
So here is the problem, and here's the big outline that we're going to follow as we start to move into Matthew 24 and 25 this morning. The problem is the sequence. Because when you get to Matthew 24, verses 29 and 31, there's a statement there that sounds an awful lot like the rapture at first glance. It says, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory." Verse 31 says, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. Now people see that word trumpet and everybody thinks that's the rapture. He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four corners of the earth. That's got to be the rapture, right? From one end of the sky to the other. And then as you keep moving down to verses 40 and 41, you have some verses that also sound an awful lot like the rapture. It says, then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. And people say, well, that's the rapture also. And so basically their argument is, you'll notice that the rapture, whether it's in verse 31 of Matthew 24 or verses 40 and 41, happens after the events of the tribulation period are described. So therefore, the rapture is something that takes place at the end of the tribulation period. So what people do is they note the order of events. These are the days of tribulation, verse 29. The whole world will see Jesus return, verse 30. The elect will be gathered to him. They think that's the rapture. And then they think the rapture is being reiterated in verses 40 and 41, where it talks about, you know, two asleep, one taken, the other left. Two working in the field, one taken and the other left. And they'll say, look, that's at the end of the tribulation. So what people say is, how do pre-tribulational theorists, which would represent myself, explain the rapture occurring before the apocalypse and before the second coming? Jesus says exactly the opposite in simple, unmistakable language. Then this person asks, are there two raptures? One before that this Jesus mysteriously didn't describe, and then this one, which he also described, would he leave one out in Matthew 24? Or is there only one, but when he discusses it, he jumbles the order of events, why would he do that? So that basically is the problem. The problem is there's a lot of stuff going on at the end of Matthew 24 after the tribulation has been described, particularly verse 31 and particularly verses 40 and 41, which look like the rapture. Many people think those verses are speaking of the rapture of the church. And since these are mentioned at the end of the tribulation period, not before, the rapture must occur at the end of the tribulation period and not before. So that is the problem. And so anybody that is trying to defend the pre-tribulational rapture, which is what I'm trying to do in this series, has to interact at some point with Matthew 24 and 25. And in fact, from my perspective, there's a very simple answer to this. In fact, this answer is so simple that it almost is insulting to one's intelligence, it feels that way, when the answer is given. And the answer is simply this, Matthew 24 and 25 have absolutely nothing to do with the church. The church is not mentioned in Matthew 24 and 25. The church is not contemplated in Matthew 24 and 25. 
And therefore, when the return of Christ is described in verse 31 and verses 40 and 41, it's not speaking of the coming of the Lord for the church. In fact, you don't even find the word church in these chapters. It's his coming for the nation of Israel to rescue them from Satan's attack through the Antichrist at the end of the tribulation period. So my thinking on it, and I haven't even tried to defend it yet. I just want you to see what it is I'm defending. Um, At this point, I'm not even asking for agreement. I'm just asking for understanding. And I'm following really what traditional dispensationalists have taught about this. This is not some new view. John F. Walvoord, a longtime defender of the pre-tribulational rapture, writes, In Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, the expositor should therefore understand that the program of God for the end of the church age has in view... Excuse me, I I misread that, didn't I? The expositor should understand that the program of God for the end of the age, not the church age, the end of the age has in view a period ending with the second coming of Christ to the earth and the establishment of his earthly kingdom, not the church age specifically ending with the rapture. Both the questions of the disciples, which we're going to walk through, and the answers of Christ are therefore keyed to the Jewish expectation based on Old Testament prophecy and the program of God for the earth in general rather than the church, and the program of God here is for the earth in general rather than the church as the body of Christ. So the answer to this so-called problem is very simple. Matthew chapters 24 and 25 is not about the church. It's not about the body of Christ. It's about God's dealings with the nation of Israel as they emerge from the tribulation period and Christ comes back in his second advent to rescue them. That's what Matthew 24 and 25 is about. Now, even amongst pre-tribulationalists, not all would agree with me on this. Some of the best people that I ever learned prophecy from are very prone to see the rapture in Matthew 24 and 25, names that you recognize. Uh, People like Arnold Fruchtenbaum, um, Ed Heinsohn, Dave Hunt, uh, Chuck Missler, Hal Lindsey. Uh, One of my first prophecy books I ever read was The Late Great Planet Earth, and Hal Lindsey quoted... Matthew 24, verses 40 and 41, and it sure looks like the rapture. So for years and years and years, I believe that was the rapture. Not fully understanding that once I moved in that direction, I was actually opening the door a crack to post-tribulationalism, not pre-tribulationalism, because verses 40 and 41 and verse 31 happen at the end of the tribulation period. So what I would like to do as we start looking at this this morning is I would like to walk us through what is called the Olivet Discourse. And I would like to show you the Jewish-Israel flavor of the whole thing. And you won't grasp it when you just jump, as so many people do, they jump right into the middle of it or right at the end of it and grab a verse. That is not a good method of Bible interpretation. You have to start at the very beginning and work your way through it. And you'll see as I go through it that this is very Hebrew and it's very Jewish. And Jesus, as he gives this discourse, is not even speaking of the church of Jesus Christ at all. The church of Jesus Christ will have already been raptured and been in heaven before these events even transpire, as I'll try to show you. So I can't do it my usual way when I teach verse by verse of taking, you know, uh, five years to go through this. Um, I'm going to kind of approach this section by section, and I'm only surfacing the relevant sections that clearly show that Jesus is speaking of the Jews at the end of the tribulation period. 
So that's a little bit of information about the problem. So let's back up to the 10,000 foot level, even before we start looking at the specific verses, and let's look at the big, big context of the Gospel of Matthew. When Matthew sat down to write his Gospel, what was he trying to do exactly? Uh, Every single Gospel writer is written or gospel, or book of the New Testament, or book of the Old Testament, for that matter, is written for a purpose. And the better you understand the purpose that Matthew was trying to accomplish in terms of the immediate impact that this would have on his first readers, the more you can understand those first readers and put yourself in their shoes and ask the questions that they ask, not the questions we ask, the questions they ask. The better you can do that, the better you understand Matthew's gospel. Matthew wrote for three reasons. Number one, to explain that the Jesus, now the Jews would not call him Jesus, they would call him by the Hebrew name Yeshua. Yeshua, Hebrew name for Jesus, Jesus Greek name for Jesus, is to explain that the Jesus in whom they had believed was their long-awaited Messiah. Who is Matthew writing to? His audience is Hebrew Christians. You have to understand that the whole early church was Jewish. I mean, everybody in the early church, as you go through the book of Acts, is Jewish. They are simply receiving by faith the Messiah that national Israel rejected. And consequently, there are no Gentiles in the early church until the conversion of who? Cornelius in Acts 10. And even after that point, the dominant population in the church is Jewish. And that doesn't really change until Paul's first missionary journey Acts 13 and 14, when he goes out finally as a missionary into Gentile territory, and he discovers that it's the synagogues that are rejecting his message, but the Gentiles are getting saved in droves. So that population change hasn't even happened yet in early Christianity, when Matthew writes. Matthew was probably, other than the book of James, which we're studying Wednesday evenings, Other than the book of James, Matthew is probably the earliest New Testament writing that we have. In fact, in the last 2,000 years of church history, that's what all of the church fathers, all of the Christians believed. Everybody believed that Matthew was the first gospel. That's why in your study Bible, when you open up to the pages of the New Testament, what is the first book that you run into? you run into Matthew. And there's a reason for that. It's been acknowledged for 2,000 years that Matthew wrote first. Matthew wrote to Hebrew Christians. Matthew wrote to Christians while the church was still primarily Jewish and he's answering a Jewish question. The idea that Mark wrote first doesn't even come into existence until the German higher critical movement in Europe in the 1800s, uh, 1900s, late 1800s, 1900s, where people started to second, second guess everything. Daniel didn't write Daniel, they say. Isaiah didn't write all of the book of Isaiah, they say. And one of the things they developed is this view called the four document hypothesis where Matthew is borrowing from a document called Q. Now, have we found Q? No, we haven't. This whole thing is fictitious. Uh, Q comes from the German word quell, which means source. So what liberals think is poor Matthew, who was an eyewitness, couldn't put an original thought together. So he had to borrow from Q, and he had to borrow from Mark, And that's how they explain the similarities between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as if the Holy Spirit couldn't have given the same 
basic outline to all three. Prior to the advent of that thesis, which is called the documentary hypothesis, which comes from liberalism, that's its source, everybody believed that Matthew was the first gospel. And that's what I believe. I believe that primarily because Matthew is a Jewish gospel. You'll look at the genealogy of Christ in Matthew's gospel, and it links Christ back to David and then to Abraham, Matthew chapter 1. Well, Luke's gospel doesn't do that. Luke links Christ, Luke 3, genealogically all the way back to who? To Adam. Well, why does Luke link him to Adam and Matthew links him to Abraham and David? Because Luke is written to a Gentile believing audience, a man named Theophilus. Matthew, uh, Luke on the other hand, is written to a Gentile believing audience. Matthew on the other hand is written to a Hebrew Christian audience. For example, you'll go to Matthew 15 and there's this ritual of, there's just this Jewish ritual of washing of hands. Matthew doesn't explain it. Now Mark's gospel, Mark 7, records the same story with the same ritual and then Mark throws in this uh, parenthetical comment, this was a common practice among the Jews. So why would Mark have to explain that? Because Mark is writing not to a Jewish audience, but to a Roman Christian audience. Matthew, on the other hand, is not writing to a Roman Gentile Christian audience. He is writing to a Hebrew Christian audience. There is no need to explain something that they already understood. You follow where I'm going here? So you have to put yourself in the mindset of a first century Jew who has come to faith in Yeshua the Messiah, who has repented, meaning changed their mind. They believe that the nation of Israel in its rejection of Christ was wrong, and Peter had the right message on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. That's the crowd that Matthew is writing to. And if you can put yourself in their shoes and ask the questions that they're asking, You'll understand everything in Matthew's gospel. The primary thought on the mind of a Hebrew Christian is where in the world is the kingdom? I mean, if Christ is the king, we believe he's the king, we've trusted him for personal salvation, then where is his kingdom? And so these Hebrew Christians were starting to have doubts about whether they believed in the right Messiah. Because the Old Testament always predicted king and kingdom coming together, like horse and carriage. Once the king is here, the kingdom will be here. Unto us, Isaiah 9, verse 6, a child is born. What's the rest of the verse say? And the what? Government will rest upon his shoulders. Well, the child's been born, but where's his government? So Matthew is carefully explaining by recording all kinds of things in the events of Christ that he was an eyewitness to see, that, yeah, Jesus is the king, no doubt about it. But the kingdom that he promised to bring in didn't come because the nation rejected him. That particular kingdom has not been canceled, but it's been what? Postponed. Postponed. And by the way, one of these days that kingdom will come. Now, if you can understand that question and that answer, then suddenly everything in Matthew's gospel makes perfect sense, including the Olivet Discourse. So what are Matthew's purposes? To explain that the Jesus in whom they, who's the they? Hebrew Christians, that they had believed in was indeed the long-awaited Messiah. That's purpose number one. You believed in the right guy. Based on the genealogy, based on his miracles that he did, based on the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. I mean, Matthew goes into painstaking detail explaining this. So then his second purpose is to explain why the kingdom has been postponed, not canceled. 
postponed despite the fact that the king had arrived. A, Jew, a Jewish person needs an answer to that question. And even when you evangelize a Jewish person today, they have that exact same question. Uh, I remember when I was in graduate school, I, in law school, I had access to just a lot of Jewish people, not to be stereotypical at all. Professors, students, and here I was, a Protestant Christian, an evangelical Christian in that environment, and I used to really get into countless conversations with people about Jesus. And it always mystified me why a Jewish person does not believe Jesus is their Messiah when Isaiah 53 is so clear. I mean, how, how can you miss that? And in the course of those conversations, what I discovered is the answer that was always given back to me is there is no shalom, is what they would say. Now, what's the Hebrew word for shalom? Peace. There's no peace. Now, when they use the word peace, it's not like we use it as evangelical Christians. We talk about peace with God, peace in the heart. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about the Middle East. They're talking about the United Nations. They're talking about the world's hostility against tiny Israel. And they don't understand that first spiritual shalom has to happen in a person before the political shalom can come into existence. And so their primary issue is the same as was when Matthew wrote this book. If Christ is the king, where is his kingdom? So Matthew's second purpose is to explain why the kingdom had been postponed despite the fact that the king had arrived. In other words, he's not even trying to evangelize these people. He's trying to confirm them in what they've already believed. Don't panic is what he's saying. Don't hit the panic button. Don't start thinking that Jesus isn't the guy because he is. Well, then where's his kingdom? It's coming. It's just in a state, current state of postponement. And then his third purpose in writing Matthew's gospel is to explain the interim program of God. That's us, right? The church. While the kingdom is not here. And so everything you read in Matthew's gospel is going to fit into one or more of those purposes. If you understand what I just said, the whole gospel of Matthew will open up to you. And everything that he says will start making sense. So Matthew's message is this, Jesus is the predicted Jewish or Hebrew king who ushered in an interim program by building the sons of the kingdom, that's who we are by the way, sons of the kingdom. Paul says in Galatians 4 verse 7, if a son then a what? Then an heir. We are heirs of the coming kingdom. The kingdom is coming. And what the Lord is doing now is he's building a group of people into the church that are the sons of the kingdom. Matthew's message is Jesus is the predicted Hebrew king who ushered in an interim program by building the sons of the kingdom into the church. In between Israel's past rejection of her king, that's what happened in the first century, but before that time period emerges when a future generation of Israel will accept Christ as their king. In the events of the tribulation period, after the church has been removed from the earth. So Matthew very carefully traces what we call the offer of the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, preached by John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the 12 and the 70. He explains that in detail. That's basically what he's doing in Matthew 1 through 10. And then beginning in chapter 11 and primarily in chapter 12, he explains that the leadership of the nation rejected that offer. And the moment they rejected that offer, the offer is withdrawn. Now, the day in history will come when a future generation will accept the offer, but not today, not this generation. Not for the last 2,000 years. And since God never leaves the earth without a witness of himself, he's doing another program today via the church, which, by the way, was also predicted. 
Um, I don't know if so much of it was predicted, but God knew it would come into existence. Because the great Apostle Paul in Ephesians 3, I want to say around verse 11, calls the church, which is us, part of the eternal purpose of God. So don't get the idea that God got sweaty palms and said, oh no, what am I going to do? Israel rejected my son. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll pull out of my back pocket here the church and just toss it in. That is not a correct understanding of the Bible. God knew the nation would reject Christ, even though he gave them the free will as the leadership to accept it or reject it. And they turned down the offer. They could have had the millennial kingdom in a nanosecond. And since God never leaves the earth without a witness of himself, he went into full motion with his plan and eternal purpose of God, and he created the church, which is us. We are believers in the Messiah that national Israel rejected. Not that a Jewish person today can't get saved. Many do. But the primary makeup of the church in this present age is primarily Gentiles. And you'll see that all the way through the book of Acts as Paul goes in one synagogue after another and gets kicked out. And he leaves the synagogue and he reaps this great harvest amongst the Gentiles. So we are part of this new man called the church, Jews and Gentiles, in one new man called the church of Jesus Christ. That's the interim program of God And Matthew will record events in the life of Christ signaling the coming of the church age. Matthew's gospel has five major discourses in it. Five major sermons. How do we know that? Because there's a little phrase that shows up at the end of each discourse. And it says this, when he had finished saying these things... He says that in Matthew 7, 28, Matthew 11, verse 1, Matthew 13, verse 53, Matthew 19, verse 1, and Matthew 26, verse 1. It's a literary clue telling us a major sermon has just concluded. And by looking at that clue, we know that in Matthew's gospel, there are five major sermons. Number one. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Discourse number two, the missions discourse, where he sent out the 12 to offer the kingdom to Israel, Matthew 10. Number three, the postponement parables of the kingdom. The parables explaining that the kingdom is in a state of postponement, Matthew 13. Now, oh my goodness, what happened in between Matthew 10 and Matthew 13? Matthew 12 happened. You guys all agree with me on that? That Matthew 12 is in between 10 and 13? So what in the world happened in chapter 12? That's when the nation rejected the offer. And the key turning point is when they attributed Christ's miracles to Satan. Once the leadership did that, the offer is withdrawn. And now we get an explanation of what God is doing while the kingdom is in postponement, awaiting a future generation to receive the offer. And that's what's happening there with the kingdom parables in Matthew 13. Fourth discourse is the discourse on humility. Matthew 18. And the last discourse is the what? Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, which is our discourse. That's the one we're studying. That's the one where everybody thinks the rapture is in there. And I'm here to explain that Matthew 24 and 25 is not dealing with the rapture. Matthew 24 and 25 is the final leg of the journey. We know that the kingdom has been rejected. We know that the kingdom has been postponed. But it's got to come to the earth some way, right? How and when is it going to come? Aha, Matthew 24 and 25 is there as our explanation. Showing us that Israel, not the church, will be put into a time of distress 
unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, but through it, a remnant of Israel will be saved nationally. There's coming a point in time in history when every single Jew on planet Earth, subsequent to the rapture, will be in faith. And that's what will trigger and bring Christ back to the earth to rescue them. So Matthew 24 and 25 is there not to show the offer of the kingdom, the rejection of the kingdom, the postponement of the kingdom. It's not there to explain the interim program while the kingdom is not here, but it is there to explain how the kingdom one day will be accepted. And God is going to fulfill every single promise he ever made to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if you are a Jew today, Matthew says, who has believed in Christ, don't sweat it. Don't be worried. Jesus is the guy. And there's an explanation why the kingdom is not here right now. But don't worry. The kingdom's going to come to the earth one day after this season of postponement is over. Now, the number five is highly significant. How many discourses are, are there in Matthew's gospel? Five. Who was Matthew's gospel written to? Hebrew Christians. You know what number a Jew understands? Five. They understand that number real well. Why is that? Well, the, the, the books of Moses... The foundation for Judaism is what we call Torah, sometimes called Pentateuch, because how many books are there? Five. That's the whole foundation of Judaism. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Not six, not four, but five. The book of Psalms. How many Psalms do we have we have 150 psalms in how many books? Five books. David goes to slay Goliath. How many stones does he have in his backpack? Five. I mean, in Judaism, and I don't know what it is exactly, but the number five shows up over and over again. And that's why Matthew, writing to a Hebrew Christian audience, is surfacing the number five. He gives you five discourses of Christ. Not four, not three, not seven, not 15, but these five as an explanation, where is the kingdom? So that is exactly what, you've, what you do with the Olivet Discourse. You understand it in the whole flow of Matthew's gospel. And you understand it as the time period in which the nation yet future will accept the offer and the kingdom will come. Now, today everybody has these awareness buttons. Cancer research awareness. Climate change awareness. Social justice awareness. I, need, I want someone to make another awareness button. Can we do that? I want a button that says, all of it discourse, upper room discourse awareness. Because most people don't have any understanding because they've never really been taught correctly on the difference between the all of it discourse, which is what we're studying, and the upper room discourse. And most people just take the two and ram, they use uh, the ram, jam, and cram method of Bible interpretation. Just ram, ram and, and scrambled eggs, ram it all together. But the fact of the matter is those are totally two different discourses. And if you don't keep them separate, you're going to be confused your whole Christian life as to what verse goes with what subject. So in the final week of Christ's life, he gave two major discourses, Olivet Discourse and the Upper Room Discourse. Olivet Discourse, which is what we're starting to look at here, is in Matthew 24 and 25. Upper Room Discourse is not found in Matthew's Gospel. It's found in John's Gospel, John 13 through 17. Where was the location of the Olivet Discourse? It was the Mount of Olives. 
and I may have shared this with you before, but I asked that in one of my classes once. I say, why do we call this the Olivet Discourse? And a fellow raised his hand and says, because we get all of it. And that's not right. <laughs> it's called the Olivet Discourse because it was given on the Mount of Olives. The Upper Room Discourse, we call the Upper Room Discourse because it was given in the Upper Room. Now, Christ gave both in the final week of his life prior to his crucifixion. The Olivet Discourse, he get, this is very important to understand this, he gives on the third day of the Passion Week. The Upper Room Discourse, he gives on day six of the Passion Week. The Upper Room Discourse deals with the church. The Olivet Discourse deals with Israel. So when Christ gave the Olivet Discourse, they knew next to nothing about the church. In fact, there's just one veiled disclosure, maybe two, but the first one, the first veiled disclosure of the church in Matthew's gospel that they would have any awareness of is Matthew 16, verse 18, where following the nation's rejection of their Messiah, Christ makes a statement, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And that probably shocked the daylights out of them because they knew nothing about the church. Everything was Israel. And the church was the instrument that God was going to use in the season of postponement. And other than that statement, you have no explanation of the church. We've got to wait for a man named Paul who was going to get converted, Acts 9, and he's going to write 13 letters filling out everything you'd ever want to know about the church. Which explains why Paul was in jail so many times. This is the first century. I mean, there's no tattoo place to get a tattoo. There's no weightlifting. There's no cable TV. I mean, it was solitude. And the man had nothing to do but hear from God. And that's why it was the providence of God that he kept finding himself in jail. Have you noticed that? Philippi, Caesarea, he's in jail in Rome twice. In fact, that's where he died, Paul, writing 2 Timothy, one of these 13 letters. So if we didn't have those writings, we wouldn't know anything about the church. So when Christ gave the, upper, uh, the Olivet Discourse, church, what church? No one knew anything about the church. It's not until the upper room discourse, given on day six, several days later, that he starts to unfold the church. The general focus of the Olivet Discourse is a farewell address to the nation of Israel, explaining to Israel her future, distant future, now that the leadership in the first century rejected him as their king. But that's not what Christ is doing in the upper room discourse. He's saying hello to the church. The specific focus of the Olivet Discourse is Israel's future. The specific focus of the upper room discourse, which concerns our age, is the divine provisions for the church. Which include the coming of the paraclete or the Holy Spirit who will be in you for how long? Forever. John 14, 16, and 17. Those are the kinds of things he's dealing with in the upper room discourse on day six of the Passion Week that he's not dealing with in the Olivet Discourse on day three of the Passion Week. What prompted the Olivet Discourse? Well, the Hebrews were very proud of their temple. They've always been proud of it. And they were walking along there on the Mount of Olives and they were looking at how beautiful the temple was and Jesus just says, oh, by the way, guys, this whole thing is going to be torn apart brick by brick. And no doubt that jolted them to the absolute core of their being. And they wanted to know, when are these things going to be? And they wisely connected it with the events of the end of the age and they said, when are these things going to be? What is the sign of the coming? You're coming and tell us about the end of the age. And so Jesus says, okay, I'll tell you. And he spends two chapters explaining that to them. How Israel will receive him 
as king in the distant future and the kingdom will come. What prompted the upper room discourse? He said, I'm leaving. He kept telling him over and over again, I'm leaving, I'm departing. And that shocked him again because he was all they knew. They had been with him for over three years. John, who records the discourse for us, was probably the closest companion of Christ. He was their mentor. You know, it was John that leaned against the chest of Christ there in the upper room. And so when Jesus says, I'm leaving, that shocked, shocked him as well. And then Jesus says, oh, don't worry that I'm leaving. Because when I leave, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, once I ascend back to the Father's right hand, my first order of business is to send the who? The paraclete or the helper, or the Holy Spirit that will be in you, not on you, as was the case in Old Testament times, but in you for how long? Forever. Then he says, through that ministry, I will come and comfort you. And that's the circumstances that gave rise to the upper room discourse. So the both discourses started with different questions. All of it discourse, he is dealing with written Old Testament material. Because Israel's future is already outlined in the Old Testament. And that's why he keeps quoting Old Testament passages to get the point across to them. Upper room discourse, not a lot of Old Testament cited there. A few Old Testament passages concerning the betrayal by Judas, but other than that... He doesn't cite any, a lot of Old Testament. Why not? Because the church was never revealed in the Old Testament. In fact, the church is going to be filled out in letters that these guys in the upper room, 11 of them, are going to write. So that's why there's not a lot of interaction with the Old Testament in the upper room discourse, but there's a ton of interaction with the Old Testament in the Olivet discourse. And when Christ teaches the apostles in the Olivet Discourse, he is looking at them as foundation stones of Israel. He is looking at them in the Matthew 19 verse 28 sense, where he says, you will sit on 12 thrones governing the 12 what? Tribes. So he's looking at, that, at them in that role. But on day six of the Passion Week, he addresses the same group, but he's no longer looking at them, the apostles, as the foundations of Israel, but he's looking at them in the latter Ephesians 2.20 sense, where they are going to become the foundation stones of the what? The church. So these apostles, they're, they're transitional characters. He's looking at them as leaders of Israel in Matthew 24 and 25, but in John 13 through 17, he's looking at them as leaders in the coming church. So when God put, built the church, the first stone he put in, using the temple metaphor, Ephesians 2 and 3, is the cornerstone. And the cornerstone is the first stone that goes into the structure because the cornerstone, if you knew what it was about, and where it was, you can align every other stone according to that cornerstone. And so the cornerstone is who? Jesus. And then as that temple, metaphorically the church was being built, he put in the foundation stones, which were the apostles. And he built the church on that structure. So when he talks to them in John 13 through 17, he's looking at them in the Ephesians 2.20 sense. When he talks to them in Matthew 24 and 25, he's looking at them in the Matthew 19 verse 28 sense. So these, these two discourses could not be more different. They could not be more separated. And what people do is... They're in a church that never gives them this background at all. Most, most people have never had this background. And so people hear about the rapture 
And they rush to the Olivet Discourse and they grab some verses that look a lot like the rapture. And I'm here to tell you that it, it can't be the rapture because Jesus is not even dealing with the church in Matthew 24 and 25. He's dealing with Israel. If you want to find the rapture, you don't find it in Matthew 24 and 25. You find it where? In the Upper Room Discourse. And there you're going to find it. It's in John 14, 1 through 3, where he says, In my Father's house are many you know, dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, behold, I go away and prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself that were... I am, you may be also, and so we shall forever be with the Lord. That's the rapture. You don't find that in Matthew 24 and 25, but you do find it in the upper room, John 13 through 17. So what people do is they cast their fishing line into the wrong lake. And I think Brother Jim has said this, If you cast your fishing line into the wrong lake, looking for the wrong things, you're probably going to get a boot out of it. You're going to pull up a boot. And because so many people are looking for the rapture in Matthew 24 and 25, they're they're pulling up a boot. Or if they just put their fishing line not into the wrong lake, but into the correct lake, they'd get a great big beautiful fish out of it. And this explains a lot of the confusion that's happening today related to rapture teachings. And so that's why I wanted to give you that 10,000 foot level context. Now, having said all that, let's move to number three here and let's look at the immediate context. And let's see what starts the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 23 comes before Matthew what? 24. So if you want to understand what's going on in Matthew 24, you've got to read Matthew 23. Amen? So what is going on in Matthew 23? I've got a new Bible I'm using. My other one fell apart, which is good, right? A Bible that's not falling apart is usually owned by someone who is falling apart. Or, I think I said that wrong. If your Bible is falling apart, that means you're not falling apart. Amen? So I used to have a red letter edition of the Bible. And if you start, and some of you may have red letter editions, because those are the words of Christ. That's what the editor is trying to show us. As you go all the way through this chapter, it's all in red. And I used to say, as a new Christian, I think they put that in red, because Jesus is really mad here. And that's actually true. He is ticked off. He, he is ticked off at first century Israel's leadership, not Jews in general, but the leadership because they stumbled over the obvious. They, could, they, they rejected who he was and they could have had the millennial kingdom. And so he pronounces all of these woes. I think there's eight woes pronounced. And then he says in verse 36, For I say to you, all these things will come upon, look at verse 36, and please underline this in your Bible, this generation. That's a big deal later in Matthew 24, 34. This generation. So they're moving off into discipline, which is going to be imposed on this generation, What generation? The generation of Israeli leadership that rejected their king. And he's speaking of the discipline that was about to come 40 years later at the hands of the Romans in AD 70. Now, if you're a Jew who's a Christian reading this, you're starting to think, well, I guess God is through with the Jew. I guess Israel has been cut off from the plan and purposes of God because, God, because Jesus is so angry here in Matthew 23. And in fact, uh, there are countless churches and denominations that will tell you that very thing. God is through with Israel, Israel's cord has been cut, and now he is at work with the church that they call the new Israel, which has replaced ethnic Israel. 
And if all I had was Matthew 23, 1 through 36, I would think that also. But I don't have just Matthew 23, verses 1 through 36. I also have verses 37 through 39, which says what? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until... For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until. From now, for I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until. Gee, Pastor, do you think the word until there is very important? Yes, it is. You should underline that one. Until you, who? Israel. Say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, notice this. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Who's he speaking there to? Israel. He doesn't say, oh, First Baptist Church, oh, First Baptist Church. I mean, it's, it's so obvious that he's speaking to national, ethnic Israel in the first century. He says how, and this imagery is, is beautiful, how often I wanted to gather you together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. I came to you the first time, and just like a hen would gather her chicks under her wings. I wanted to do that with you, Israel, in the first century when I came. Now, this word gather is very significant. It's the verb episunago. Do you recognize any words derived from sunago? Synagogue. It's Jewish language. Synagogue is a Jewish gathering. I came to you the first time and I wanted to have synagogue with you. But you were unwilling. Now, when you get into Matthew 24, verse 31, which everybody thinks is the rapture, what does he say? He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together. What's our verb? Episunago, that's the same one that we just read about in Matthew 23. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. What is Jesus saying here? The synagogue that I wanted to have with you in my first coming, but you wouldn't have me, has now been postponed for a future generation who will receive me in the events of the tribulation period. And then we're going to have our synagogue. I mean, it's amazing uh, tracing of themes from Matthew 23, 37 to Matthew 24, verse 31. So I came to you the first time, but the problem wasn't me. The problem was you. You wouldn't have me. You were unwilling. Because the nation of Israel is the nation that always gets it right, not the first time, but the what? Second time, always. Stephen, a Hebrew, in his speech to the Jewish leaders, Acts 7, makes that very point in verses 6 through 38. I mean, this is a masterpiece, the sermon that Stephen gave as a representative of the first church to Israel's leadership. And he explains there in verses 6 through 38 that Israel gets it right always the second time, not the first time. He says there, look at how y'all treated Joseph. His brothers threw him into a pit, but they later received him because they needed help in the midst of famine once he had come, become second in command in Egypt. You got it right with Joseph the second time. How did y'all treat Moses? Same way. He came to you as the Redeemer, and you all said, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian the other day? And Moses, worried, fled into Midian for 40 years, and he came back out of Midian as their Redeemer, and now they've received him. 
you get it right the second time. Stephen says the same thing's happening right now. You're rejecting Jesus Christ as a nation right now. Oh, but don't worry, you're going to get it right one day the second time. Now, do you think the leaders wanted to hear that speech? What the Bible says is they sat there and started grinding their teeth. They were so angry. And they hurled so many rocks at Stephen that he died and is the first martyr of the church age. What is happening in Matthew 24 and 25 is how Israel is going to get it right the second time. Are you with me on that? That's why Episunago is repeated. The synagogue I wanted with you in my first coming, you didn't get right, but you're going to get it right in the events of the tribulation period. So I came to you the first time, the problem wasn't me, the problem was you. Jesus says, you were unwilling, and behold, your house, what's the house? Their temple. Your house is left to you desolate. Now, didn't he always call the temple my house? My father's house shall be a house of prayer. He doesn't say that anymore. He says it's your house. The reason it's your house and not my house is you kick me out of it. So behold, your house is being left to you desolate. Hey, That's why the Olivet Discourse is filled with all kinds of information about the temple. What triggers the whole thing? Questions about the temple. What's the Antichrist going to do midway through the tribulation period? Desecrate the temple. Why does it keep saying temple, temple, temple all the way through? Because that's the statement that he led with. Your house is left to you desolate. Now let me show you what's going to happen to your house. And let me show you how God is going to restore your house, and it's going to be made my house once again. Then he says in verse 39, watch this very carefully. For I say to you, who's you? Israel. From now on, you will not see me. What's our magic word? Until you say what? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Why is that in quotes? Because it's Psalm 118, verse 26. That's a messianic psalm. You see what the Lord is saying here? I am not coming back for this nation until you publicly acknowledge me as your Messiah. And until that day in history comes, I'm not coming back with my kingdom. I'm waiting for a national response. And how in the world is the Lord going to get this national response from Israel? They are going to be hurled into the seven-year tribulation period where their pride will be broken off them. And they will publicly acknowledge Christ as the Messiah. And Jesus Christ will return to the earth. Well, where do we... Where do we read about that? It's all in Matthew 24 and 25. By the way, no extra charge for this. Watch this very carefully. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, what's the popular evangelistic method today? A, B, C. Admit you're a sinner. Believe in Christ and confess Christ. Why do they all think that? Well, because it's in Romans 10, 9 and 10, right? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So there must be three steps to Jesus. Now, you look at our gospel tracts out there, we have nothing like that out there because we don't think it's biblical. We do not believe in A, B, C. We believe in B, period. The only requirement that's ever made of a lost sinner is they must trust in the Messiah after the Spirit convicts them of their need to do so. 
So once they're under conviction, we give them the gospel, which is to believe in Christ. But what about Romans 10, 9, and 10? That's in every gospel track in Christianity today. What about the sea? Well, where is Romans 10? It's in a context of Romans 9, 10, and 11, where Paul is dealing with the nation of Israel. Romans 9, Israel in the past rejected by God. Excuse me, let me say that again. Romans 9, Israel in the past elected by God. Romans 10, Israel in the present rejected by God. Romans 11, Israel in the future accepted by God. Romans 11. So Romans 10 goes right into a whole section where Paul is dealing with not the church, but with the nation of Israel. And Paul says what Israel has to do is they have to confess Christ with their mouth. And Paul in the process is reminding us of what verse? Matthew 23, 39. From now on you will not see me until you, Israel, what? Say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When God outlined the plan of salvation, he never gave us the ABC method. He gave us the B method. And therefore, calling on Christ publicly is not something that a Christian has to do today. They simply have to believe. Well, how do you know that? Because John 12 verse 42 tells me that. When it says there were many believing, but we're not confessing. I mean, are you telling me that someone that gets saved in a Muslim world is not saved? Because they haven't been outspoken about Christ? Because they know that if they say one word about Christ, their family could be killed? That's insanity. The only condition that God gives is to believe. Well, then what do you do with Romans 10, 9, and 10? You hook it on to verse 39 here. And I'm completely justified in doing that because Romans 9, 10, and 11 is all dealing with who? The nation of Israel. This is a condition that Israel must meet. They have to publicly acknowledge Christ as the Messiah. The leadership must cite Psalm 118 verse 26 for Jesus to return to the earth at the end of the tribulation period and rescue Israel from the wrath of Satan and the beast. Are you following? So simply understanding the basic context of Matthew 24 and 25 saves you from a lot of mistakes like trying to find the rapture in here and trying to build some sort of evangelistic formula here. So anyway, look at that, I'm seven minutes over. Let's, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this teaching, this study. Some of these things are difficult for us because our file drawers are being rearranged. But we want to be accurate dividers of your word in these last days and be kept away from confusion. So help us in that task. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen.